And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment to the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Broken Blade Publishing, a, ma a man of both Hema and of t and of and of tabletop, and a man who is bringing the lanch necks in, in into their proper place in role playing through through Streets of Peril, which originally was using 5e, now is using its own system called PD6. We'll get into that. The one and only Kyle Griswold. How you doing today, man? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for com thank you for coming on. I had. I had to focus on the lanch neck thing because, well, you you put you put it in big bold letters on your site. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I emphasized the lanch connects very much. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose I suppose I suppose the first the first question that we should get into is about two years ago. I had you I had you on when Streets of Peril was just going to be a five E campaign setting. So I'd like you to walk me through the chain of events that led from you sh shifting away from five from the five E hack that you were doing into this um, PD six this PD six system that you're utilizing. Sure. Um, so originally, when we were working, or when I was coming up with um, Streets of Peril. Uh, the intention was to create a either like an OSR or a fifth edition, and ultimately end up being a fifth edition setting book with a uh, Renaissance setting. Um, and I attempted to put it up on Kickstarter. I had most of the the book written for fifth edition, and. At the time, I had no idea how to run a Kickstarter and didn't know all the uh, all the work that goes into uh, the, the pre-campaign and everything else. So uh, it didn't work out. And probably well, maybe the last week of the campaign, while I was still on Kickstarter, I took that as a opportunity to reevaluate um, what I wanted to do with this. Um, I decided I was going to keep working on Streets of Peril, and I was just going to finance it out of pocket. Um, but I had already, probably about halfway through that Kickstarter for the fifth edition setting guide, I had already started to realize that there were some things that I wanted to to do with the game that was not going to be easy with um, the D20 system. And so, and I had already been starting to play with some mechanical ideas on if I wanted to do combat differently, have armor work differently, have magic work differently, what sort of things would I do? How would I make a rule system to accommodate that? And so I, it actually ended up being like right at the end when that, that original Kickstarter was just about to fail, I was like really hoping, please no one back this thing because I really don't want to have to fulfill this book that I didn't want to make anymore. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I started working on what we what we now call the the Perilous D6 rule system, uh, which uh, the current Streets of Peril game uh, runs off. Of. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were if what when it comes to the tra the transition to Perilous D6, I'll get. Oh, I suppose the first question I should ask is, what made you go with a D6 um, die pool? So, I there was a couple of different things I'd been playing around with. Um, one, I didn't want to do uh, D20 because I think one of my, my first issues with it was the target number, which is armor class, to hit someone. Traditionally, what if you're a little, at least in most iterations of D&D. Your, your armor class doesn't necessarily represent your armor. It could. It could also represent how well you can parry something, how well you can dodge something. And um, I didn't really like the idea that mechanically 
a slippery, uh, agile fighter who weaves and ducks and dodges uh, mechanically plays out the same as a uh, slow, lumbering uh, giant just clad in thick steel. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one thing where I, I kind of wanted to get away from. Now, I, I know other D20 games have used a um, armor as damage reduction. Uh, so it's not to say that you can't do it that way. It's just that I, I, I wanted to try and play with some other ideas on how to make a an agile character who dodges blows feel different than a character who's just uh, wearing lots of armor. And um, I didn't want to do a D100 uh, system because my experience with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was that uh, it's very whiffy, especially early on. You know, if you if you're if you had a thirty percent or thirty to forty percent chance to hit, and the baddies all have a thirty to forty percent chance to hit because it's a, like the first session of a game, it's just whiff, 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 whiff. Whiff of uh, that. Yeah, and it just it it's it's boring. It's dragged out. It's you know like I know that some people complain about how long. Um, some D20 games can drag out because of um, some games have really high hit point thresholds. But I would even argue that slowly withering away someone's hit point pool is more entertaining than just missing over and over again. Um, so yeah, so right off the bat, I didn't want to do D100. I do. I think there's. I think there are ways to do a D100 game if I had a. If I really thought about it, you could do it without as much whiffing, but I didn't want to spend that much time on it. And I also knew that um, the game was already going to be, I mean, there's a lot of nods in Streets of Peril to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, as there was uh, right off the bat. I mean, you brought Launch Connects, uh, both Streets of Peril and Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, are, they both have settings which are inspired by the 16th century Holy Roman Empire. So... I didn't feel like I didn't want to just do a complete clone, so that was another reason why I wanted to avoid the D100 system. Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately, with the dice pool mechanics that um, we ended up uh, coming up with and settling on, uh, one of the things that I really like with Parallel D6 versus most um, dice mechanics is that. Because combat rolls are opposed, so it's not me hitting a target number, it's I roll my attack dice and you roll your defense dice, it rewards characters who are more skilled. And so even like, uh, let's say you take a d20 system, you have just as much chance of rolling a 1 as you do a 20. And so there are times when your super powerful skilled fighter who's attacking a peasant uh, just whiffs and can whiff over and over again. Whereas in Streets of Peril, you're going to consistently more often see very skilled fighters being able to um, outclass much weaker combatants more often. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, when... Now I did I did take a I did take a look through the um the PD6 document that you have on Drive Through RPG. That's that is as I understand is meant to be is meant to be setting agnostic but in a roundabout way is kind of a preview of Streets of Peril. And while that game and while that entr that book does have um classes, would it be fair of me to say that um Classes in the PD6 system are more of a starting package than anything else. You know, some something somewhat akin to careers in Warhammer Fantasy or or um pl or plenty of other approaches where it's a starting package, but after that it's free form. Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. In fact, um, I said I had someone else review the book, and they actually brought up. You know how odd it is that I use classes and not levels, because typically those two go hand in hand. Um, but I actually did—I have a whole video on my uh, Broken Blade YouTube channel where I 
I kind of go through some of the design logic as to why we even used archetypes for a starting point. Mm -hmm. And the big reason, like you said, one, it's, it's like a starting package. But two, I think for me, one of the things with Streets of Peril is Streets of Peril is, is obviously it's not setting agnostic. It's, it's everything is tied to the world. And I really wanted characters um, to feel tied to the setting in some way. So classes do that in a, in a variety of different ways, including just like, for example, there are three or four different martial variants of characters, and each one plays distinctively differently from the others. And the sort of the, the, the fluff behind that uh, the lore behind that is is explained through why one archetype would how they would train and develop their martial skills versus another. Mm -hmm. uh, given the three color system that you have with the dice, a part of me is curious if you had been taking some notes from the Year Zero engine. No, I actually got that from Burning Wheel. Okay, that do that does make sense. Oh. Because I've the three games that I've seen that I've seen use that sort of different colored dice approach are Burning Wheel, um, Tech Noir slash Mech Noir, and um, Year Zero. Oh, I didn't even know that there was anyone else doing it. I um, when I was coming up, when I was trying to figure out um, how I wanted to run the dice pool, I was looking at just trying to go through as many different games with dice pulls as I could to come up with see kind of idea of like what I liked, what I could take that was good and what, what I didn't like. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I wanted to avoid was shadow run dice pulls where like you're rolling like 36 dice. 36 you know, people... dice, that's modest. <laughs> right? So, you know, you, you'd always, you always have stories where people are like, well, I have a bucket and I can fit all my dice perfectly in this bucket. And once I can't fit anymore, I know that's my dice pool and I roll that bucket. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I wanted to avoid that. And the dice colors that uh, Burning Will has, the way that they do the dice pools, is, is just a really elegant way of adjusting probability without having to just take away dice or add dice. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to cl when it comes to classes, um, would it be fair, given what I given what I saw in the preview doc, would it be fair of me to say that the way you have it work is that you get you get two traits, a set of prof a set of proficiency, a, a number of ranks of, uh, in um, skill proficiencies, a set of equipment proficiencies, and starting equipment. Yes, for PD6, that is the case. So Streets of Peril is, that's the base block of, upon which Streets of Peril will run, but mm -hmm. there's going to be a couple differences. So in Streets of Peril, you'll also pick a lineage. All characters are human, and lineage is essentially um, what your national background is, mm -hmm. or in the case of characters who are from the Cimbrian Empire, which is essentially the Holy Roman Empire, it's what your social background is, which is either commoner, burger, or noble. Yeah. And so the, the lineage options, um, they provide either some base skills, uh, maybe more starting resources, something of that nature. And then, like you said, the classes, um, I, I want to say, I haven't looked at PD6 in a while. I think PD6 has even got a watered down version of the classes as they show up in Streets of Peril. You so like the classes that are in PD in the PD6 document are basically your skit your um take on the big on the big four. Um cultist, yeah. magister, man at arms and scoundrel, which is for all intent for all intents and purposes your equivalent to respectively cleric, wizard, fighter and thief. Yeah, so there's so like one of the some there's a couple of key class traits that are in Streets of Peril for those core classes which don't appear in PD6 and most of that was just I wanted to keep PD6 simple just it's really just supposed to be getting you a, a quick idea of how everything works and if you want to 
like before you make the decision, I'm going to buy Shoots Apparel, you can run games using PD6 now. But like a good example is I think in Man at Arms, the way I have it in PD6, I don't think it has the coordinated movement special trait, which is no, uh, it has yeah. tactics and hardened soldier. Right, so it has both of those in Streets of Peril, but it also has the, like in Streets of Peril, it's signature special trait is coordinated movement. So basically, which is what we found in playtesting makes the class feel very fun and interesting because it allows the, the man arms essentially gets to pick uh, an ally within a certain distance, and that ally can move again during the man arms turn. And that movement is completely unrestricted. It can't, yeah. and it's not subject to attacks of opportunity. Now, within the class list on the Kickstarter page, a few times it does mention subclasses. Um, how does how would that work within the starting package approach that you ha that you have with classes? So, from what I've seen, so subclasses they just offer one more special trait. So you pick your core class, and then your special trait, or the, your, your subclass just offers one more special trait. The main reason why we used subclasses was to have um, some sort of, because they offer more cultural significance to the setting than just the class alone. So uh, like one of the examples I often cite when people ask about the subclasses is the duelist is, uh, very much inspired by my HEMA background. And each one of the subclasses for Duelist is a various sword school, and those sword schools each are inspired by a real historical European martial art. Just, it's funny you bring that up because a while back I was, I was oh, especially since I've been, I had been looking through stuff like Mythcraft and Tales of the Valiant, oh. The, which, uh, or rather, the the material that's there that's there right now, because obviously both aren't out yet. But I ended up getting the I ended up getting the idea of if I, if I were to reskin the core classes, um, I would have it that subclasses are reflective of organizations instead instead of a instead of a archetype. So instead of clerics getting the, the getting a domain as their subclass, it's their sect. Just that, just as one example, for knights it would be knight, not for knights, for paladins it would be um, a knightly order, as opposed to a oh, as opposed to an oath, and for fighters it was um, fighting schools. Yeah, I I think that's a great idea. I think something like that. I think I think most of the streets of peril subclasses, for the most part, are still archetypical in nature, but um, it helps narrow down. For example, so one of my big things is a, is a, a history ha with having interest in historical fighting, not just HEMA sources, which are primarily focused on dueling, but just um, fighting in general, which could include um, more uh, traditional military fighting or folk games, martial games, is that um, in medieval and early Renaissance Europe, you would have seen different uh, approaches to um, fighting depending on the context. So like um, pretty much everywhere in Europe was practicing some variation of martial games, whether it was folk wrestling, some variant where you take a cudgel and you try to smack the other guy in the head until they bleed. Um, and so you would have seen a lot of people, even if they hadn't had any formal training whatsoever, there would have been a, a, a certain demographic of people who were particularly interested in just brawling all the time, who probably would have been like your Kimbo slices of the medieval, medieval world. You know, they would have been good fighters, not because they had been training in a sword school or they had been in a mercenary company, but just because they had been swinging clubs and participating in pugilism and wrestling so often. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you know, when it comes to formal training, not all formal training is the same because uh, participating in a fencing guild is very different than participating in a muster where you are drilling for information. Mm -hmm. And so you you don't necessarily a, a, a burger, a middle class um, citizen in the Holy Roman Empire somewhere between the 14th and the 16th century 
if they had enough money, they could they could go and um, join a local fencing guild, and they could spend their free time um, fighting with weapons and learning uh, essentially like dueling and sport style combat. But how much of that is you know translatable to a battlefield? You know, different um, authors at different times in history argue that. You know, you know, there's um, there's a good book called Blades of the British Empire, which is written much later than the Renaissance. But um, there's some interesting anecdotes in there about how much of the the fencing material that you learn actually is going to show up when you're actually swinging a sword at someone. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Basically, the the classes and the subclasses for Streets of Peril, they're they're a way of explaining what is your character's training. Like, if you're the brute, your character your character is the 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 street fighter. He is he's a dude who's been probably winning small tournaments in whatever it is, whether it's wrestling or stick fighting. Um, they've been he's been doing it a lot. He's been just in t- countless scraps and brawls, and that's why that's just informed his style of fighting. While the duelist is obviously going to be more of a, a finesse um, fighter who's interested in one-on-one fighting, and the man at arms is your—he's your soldier who's basically trained to either participate in a in a launch connect mercenary company, or another thing, which is an important detail for this time and setting is, you know, in the Holy Roman Empire, again, probably around the 14th to 16th century. Uh, those living in these cities, the citizenship depended on essentially your oath that you would take up arms in the city's defense. Mm-hmm. And as a part of that, that means that meant that you had to maintain weapons and armor, which would be audited, and you could be fined if you didn't ha- main- if you didn't have those weapons and armor, and you had to participate in regular muster. So, uh, depending on your social class in a city, there's also a possibility that you've also learned how to fight in formation. Yeah, and because that's also the reason why I'm glad that that regardless of your cla- of your class, from what I've been seeing, there's a good there's a good variety of skill proficiencies that you're gonna en- that you're going to end up um, getting. Um, one thing that was in character creation in PD6 that I'm curious if Streets of Peril is going to expand upon is ambitions, and the reason why that the reason why that's an important thing for me is ambitions is definitely a case of what I call blank check design. Yes. Where you're because of the because of the fact that potentially anything could be an ambition. It is important to is to establish a degree of a degree of limitation in terms of what's a good or a bad idea. The this. This has always been my big criticism with, say, fate, because its aspect system is a blank is a blank check, but it doesn't mm-hmm. do a good job at draw, at drawing the line. You, yeah, that's an so that's an excellent point. In fact, when we first released Streets of Peril in its original uh, drive through RPG format, which some people who are listening may have purchased. Um, there was very little direction offered for ambitions, and we had lots of playtesters um, reach out and express, like, "Hey, the, it'd be helpful if we had a better idea of like what what ambition should be." So, in the um, this latest version, which is on Kickstarter now, I I made sure that I included a bunch of material in the book to give a guide to how to come up with ambitions. So, like, one of the things that I point out is, you know, an ambition should be something which requires something between four and 12 sessions to accomplish, right? So, like, if you, one of the things that someone, we've had problems with in the past is someone declares something that's too easy, and they do it in one session. And you're like, well, that's that doesn't really, that doesn't make sense. And then, or it's something that's, like, it's so obviously difficult that it's never going to be accomplished. Like, I'm going to become the emperor. So... By at least you know something where you're just saying like, hey, what is something you think that would take about four to twelve sessions to accomplish? And then on top of it, then we offer um, like basic framework ambitions 
and then provide prerequisite objectives for each one of those ambitions that, to think about. So like if you're um, a, a broad overarching ambition could be something like establish a faction where you're either going to create a mercenary company, a knightly order, a religious cult. And then on top of that, then we say like, well, what kind of prerequisite objectives are you going to be doing in session to session before you accomplish it? So maybe it's like you got to develop a reputation so that people actually have some desire to join your faction. And then you got to go recruit members. You got to either you have to come up with the funds necessary to go and, and hire people if you, or you're going to have to come up with like going out and finding other dark, dark cultists who worship the same God as you. And then the other thing too is then you also may need some formal recognition for your um, faction to actually be like an official faction. So you know, a mercenary company, uh, they have to go get a letters patent from a noble house or else they're just basically a band of thugs that, that accepts money for hire. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, we, and then on top of it, we then have sections in there for just game master tips along with each one of those ambitions just to kind of help them um, be able to talk to the players when ambitions are being declared is to come up with like, because one, there's, there's two things. One, a game master may talk to a player and say, I don't, I don't think that ambition's going to be, uh, it's going to work out really well. But instead of just saying you can't do it, it may be better to just narrow the focus of the ambition. Mm -hmm. um, or alternatively, the player may come up with something like they say, you know, my, um, my uncle killed my father. He stole this family heirloom and he's protected now because he's in this uh, uh, nobleman's court and I need, I want to get revenge. Now, okay, cool. So then you're like, now as the game master, you're asking your player, okay, well, what's your uncle's name? And do you, do you have some idea of like who this nobleman is? Like what's their, what do they do? And then it's, you're actually taking that ambition and then in doing something to modify your own setting, you're adding things to it in a way that makes it so that it is that living, breathing world where the players, because ultimately the goal of Streets of Feral is, as the game master, is not necessarily to, to come up with a, a storyline, but it's to create a living world where your players can interact with and uh, fulfill their ambitions. Mm -hmm. So, now take now with that with that in mind, um, something else I did. I did find I did find interesting is when it comes is when it comes to co when it comes to combat, um, both if, unless I'm unless I'm misreading this, both at both attacks and damage can be contested rolls. Yeah, so that's actually something a few people who gave a cursory glance of the rules were like that's just too many rolls. It's four dice rolls. It's too many. Um, but like for example, we we uh, demoed the game here in Arizona at uh, Phoenix Fan Fusion, which used to be Phoenix Comic Con, and we would just roll out the sample combats for people to show how quick it is. Because the, so the way it works is it's not you roll, I roll, you roll, I roll. It's it's an opposed roll. So if someone attacks, the attacker and the, the and the defender both roll simultaneously. They quickly count successes. They compare successes, and if the attacker has more successes, they hit. Yeah, that's what and that's then, what I was gonna, that's what I was going to say. It's not four rolls; it's two pairs. Yes, exactly. And then if they hit, they roll their damage roll, and then it, that just gets contested by the armor roll if armor's applicable, and whatever the net successes of the damage roll is, how much damage the defender takes. So it it actually is really, really fast. I mean, it's it's honestly not any slower than a tr traditional D20 game because you're going to roll your D20, and you're going to say, this is what I rolled, and the game master is going to say, you hit, that's one roll. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to say, okay, roll damage. And then you're going to roll damage, and then you're going to sit there, and you're going to add up all your little dice with the modifiers, and then you're going to say, this is tell the DM is how much damage I roll. And it's almost exact same amount of time it takes for a roll two contested rolls um yeah two pairs of contested rolls so it's really not any different yeah it's i just like when it come 
if that if that's too complex, then how then how the hell do people handle the way damage works works in World of Darkness? <laughs> yeah, I I don't I really don't I I think um, because if you're reading the book and you just see that there are four types of roles, I think that that can I can understand why someone would read that and be um, a little disconcerted by that, but when you actually roll it out and play it, it's, it's really fast. And the other thing, too, to keep in mind is dice pools and Streets of Peril are... Um, we design the game as a joy that dice pools really don't ever get out of hand. It's, it's, it's very rare that you're rolling more than 10 dice at a time. It's typically going to be closer to, like, 3 to 6. Mm -hmm. it's, and I'd, I'd say the, the only time that you'd probably end up getting more than that is if you, is if you have one of those situations... Where you have a fourteen carat hair sh um, horseshoe stuck up your ass and just keep rolling a bunch of exploding sixes. Yeah, exploding. So there's a couple of ways in which you can roll more than ten. I mean, if you if you have lots of attack dice and you hit a bunch, you hit. Because the other thing too is, the more accurate your attack is, the more damage you do. Mm -hmm. So the your success value of your attack roll, which is your net successes. So if I roll six successes on my attack roll and you roll two. To, success on your defense roll. It's a success value of four, six minus two. Mm -hmm. So that four is my base damage. So the more successes that I get on my attack roll, the more damage I do. So you could theoretically have it. So if you rolled really crazy on your attack roll and you already dealt a lot of damage just on your on your damage roll too, you could you could roll pretty high on damage theoretically. And then like you said, exploding sixes can get interesting. Yeah. And because because of the way that set that set up, um, I do appreciate that it, that it results in a situation where damage is not set. No, you you look at you look at the way damage works in most D, in most D twenty based affairs, and whether you're low level or high level, you're going to be rolling the same amount of die when you're when you're hitting when you're hitting with your axe. Yes. And I know it some might say, crit. I know some, even, and even, even, cr you're still rolling this, you're still rolling the same kind of dice. Um, yes, yeah, that's true, that's true. Is, is kind of what I'm, is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, oh. yeah, there's, yeah, there's the possibility of double damage, but that's just, that's just numbers go, that's just numbers go up with the same kind, with the same kind of dice, and not necessarily a guarantee that you're actually going to, um, do better because I've there is a certain level of despair on some, on a player's face when they get that natural 20 then they confirm it then they roll double damage and roll nothing but snake eyes <laughs> on one yes, hand yeah. it is hilarious that somebody is that unlucky on the other hand it doesn't feel like they actually. Cr it's supposed to. Ha there's supposed to be that big endorphin rush for getting a critical, which you end up getting in that kind of situation. You get it um, den denied. The carpet. The carpet yanked from under your feet. <laughs> for sure. And then the other thing too is when you have the ability um, to potentially deal crazy amounts of damage with exploding dice. Even though it's not mechanically or, or it's not going to happen very often, because it does, there is always the potential that something can hit you and do a lot of damage. Um, you can't just uh, look at a, a, a combat encounter and then calculate, okay, well, this thing can only potentially maximally do this much damage to me this turn, so I can safely go and fight it right now and then redirect my attention somewhere else. Like any goon with a knife can get can get a lucky hit on you and just kill you in one turn in Streets of Peril. Yeah. Uh, it's unlikely to happen, but it, it is a possibility. So it's not something where you're 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 certainly not a, a superhero like you are in fifth edition. Yeah, and if I'm being honest when it comes to the superhero debate, I, f I find a lot of people look at that far too simplistically. Especially especially when we when we consider um when you, can, when you consider that the that the issue is the issue is honestly twofold, um, I and I take the same approach to the oh co co 
into the the game gets the game gets boring once you get once you get into the teens level wise because on one hand you definitely have that and on the other hand um it's a failure of the game to not to not um it to when it over relies on some on something like challenge rating instead of teaching how teaching how to use the monsters in a way in a way that they can they can interact to give a proper challenge I was just going to bring up challenge rating. I think that's one of the, the one of the big differences. I think in playing something like fifth edition versus maybe older um, style games is you don't necessarily have to set up an encounter that the players can win through conventional combat every time. And that's something I explicitly state in Streets of Pearl, where like um, sometimes the players in the party they they may encounter an adversary which it would be foolish to engage with in that time and in that moment. Um, and that's okay. You know, you have to, sometimes it's, it's, it's not a good idea to have to beat everything with, uh, with force. But in, I think sometimes, you know, at least, and it, you, of course you don't have to run fifth edition the same way uh, as everyone else. But if you think of things like I, for example, I remember I, when I was, I was, game mastering for, was it, dungeon mastering for 5th edition, and I had a, uh, I had a, an, a monster that was too high level for the, the party, theoretically, and one of the players got really upset about it, um, because it wasn't the right CR, and it's like, look, you guys, no one died, you guys all lived, I don't know, but he was very upset about it, and I think when you get into that mentality of, like, how things, how you're supposed to balance fights, um, then it's it's almost like you're just you're always trying to make sure you're setting it up so that the players can win. Which that that is certain that is certainly a thing. I'd argue that I'd argue that um, in er, in earlier editions you just re, just replace CR with um, hit with hit die, but it's more it's more of just it's more of the issue of. Tr of treating the monster entries as just a bunch of numbers, as opposed to teaching players on how on how to make the on how to create a bit a bit of coordination when it comes to the monsters that they're throwing at the party. Um, and I know fourth edition gets a, gets a lot of shit, but this is one thing that they actually attempted to address by ha by having different roles for mo for monsters in the monster manual. Like you you had defenders you had you had skirmishers solos were were explicitly meant to be to be the b bags like stuff like beholders were treated as solos for instance sure the, the idea is that they're meant to take on a whole party by themselves there wasn't th there wasn't this assumption of okay this is the level that they should be for a reason for a balanced party of four which is another problem with cr where it tr where it has those assumptions and the thing the thing is it's a bit it's a bit of an ask to assume that you're always going to be dealing with a balanced party of the of four of four players using the big four classes and Occam's razor comes to comes to mind when it comes to this sort of situation you know so it the better theory is the one that operates on the least assumptions Sure. Yeah, I, I think one of the other, I think the other potential knock on um, fifth edition, as far as you know, the the superhero accusation is that you know it doesn't it doesn't take a very high level character to get into a position where they can line up uh, a small regiment of enemies. That are significantly weaker and just wait in there um, and mangle them all by themselves, um, and which is fine because you're a you're a hero. But I think one of the things with uh, Streets of Peril is uh, even a a very competent, skilled, well-equipped character in Streets of Peril um, doesn't want to find themselves in a dark alley. Um, getting dragged into the ground by five muggers with knives, um, and there are there is some mechanical elements there which makes it so that 
um, being overwhelmed by attackers uh, is potentially dangerous, no matter how skilled or well equipped you are. Though, you want you want to know what I always find funny? Mm. The people people talk about how about how fifth edition people talk people bring up the superhero argument, and yet their fa- and yet their favorite characters in fantasy are are characters like Conan or Guts from Berserk, <laughs> or e- or even even Doom Guy for fuck's sake. Well, yeah, I mean my I, my favorite author of all time is Robert E. Howard. So I mean I I don't have a problem with you know playing a game where your character can fight off thirty dudes by himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not a um, that's not necessarily a criticism. You know, I, it probably came off that way. But I'm just saying it is um, it's a style of 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 gaming which is not necessarily consistent with uh, a little more gritty or realistic t- style of play. Yeah. Oh well, be- that's ki- that's kind of the that's, that's kind of the reason why I brought why I brought that up because there is that there is there is that I- there is that irony. Especially, especially sure. when, especially when people um, double down on re- double double down on realism in the in ridiculous ways. I've always I've always said that believability is more important than realism. Yeah, well, and I think there's a lot of things that are in gaming that are more important than realism. I think realism's sort of on the the lower end on the ladder for me as far as what's important. But um, I think that. You want enough realism so that players and game masters don't have to entirely suspend their disbelief. I think people want. I think people want to to suspend their disbelief, but it's more of um, make uh, making sure making sure that they can buy into it, which is what. Yeah. Which is why I, which is why I say said um, believability. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong in a game where characters can call meteors down from the sky uh, and transform into dragons. That I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable that uh, those you would expect those characters to be able to perform incredible supernatural feats of, of martial prowess. Either mm-hmm. um, it's just what. Um, what are you looking for? Like, if you're playing Call of Cthulhu, um, there's a certain expectation of of how the the game's going to run, and it's not necessarily the way that a fifth edition game is going to play out. It's fun. It it's though. Ultimate, ultimately, I think I think I look at the superhero debate as emblematic of a bigger problem, and this is a problem that I, I see with a lot of not ju- not just with D and D, although that although that is one of the bigger culprits. But a lot of approaches to fantasy games, and that is there. Is, there is this idea, this idea of this bro- of this broad pastiche of um, fantasy. Yeah, and I've I've I pick on D and D about this because this has been a problem for years. Of you keep cl- you keep claiming oh oh you can run any kind of fantasy with this, but it's cl- but there's a very Shit or get off the pot kind of mentality that's been present for years. Yeah, my uh, on that in general, or that I mean, you you can be pretty flexible with it to a certain extent, but you're right. I mean, the 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 rules and the mechanics are designed to encourage a certain type of play. Mm-hmm. Which is larger than life heroes in a high fantasy world, uh, performing supernatural feats. Yeah, which if you're, if that's the approach, if that's the approach you want, you want to go with, then just embr- embrace it instead instead of pussyfooting around. That's yeah. that's why that's why you're not going to see me make this complaint about say Godbound because it is clearly designed for that larger than life mythological approach. Um now obviously I'm not gonna have that issue with Streets of Peril because it is it is very dead set on the type of fantasy it is it is intended to be. Yeah and um I mean the I think um if I had a one of the things I've tried to do to emphasize in this book is more of a 
a sword and sorcery type theme. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that, you know, I was complaining earlier about um, sort of superhero mentality. It's not that I don't think characters in Streets of Peril get to ridiculously um, powerful levels, but there is certainly the um, a little bit of the potential Conan, Solomon Kane type um, level of prowess. Yeah. Um, and um, one of the, the big themes in the book is that um, the, the, one of the ideas is it's players playing human characters and those human characters uh, embracing their common humanity to overcome the supernatural other. Which, um, that's that's part of the reason why I brought up guts. I'm not sure yes. how much of Berser how much of Berserk you've read, but even yes. even throughout all this, even throughout all the stuff, he's he is still extremely hu he is still extremely human, and even when be even when being given a a magic set of armor, that magic set of armor has a lot of um, catches. Like the Berser the yeah. Berserker yeah. armor is not. Is not is not a is not an is not an invincibility cheat code. Well, one of the things the, the thing that I, I like about Howard's stories is that his characters, yes, they're they're typically like well, let's say in the case of Conan and Solomon Kane, they're obviously skilled combatants. Um, but it's the fact that they sort of dig down deep into this primal um, part of themselves to overcome um, the supernatural and these these things that normally drive men to madness and sort of touching on humanity's ability to, to overcome things like that which I, I've always found uh, compelling you know my when I think my one of my favorite stories is skulls in the stars mm -hmm. where um, Solomon Kane's going through like a bog or a fen late at night and the villagers tell him, no, you can't go there. There's an evil spirit and it's going to attack you. And he's like, eh, no. And he goes in there and, and the thing, this, this thing starts to manifest a specter and it's howling and it's laughing at him. And he, uh, he discharges his pistol into it and it laughs because it can't be harmed by the pistol. So then he unsheaths the sword and his steel doesn't do anything to it. And then it pins Solomon Kane to the ground and it's, it's laughing maniacally because it's it knows it's going to kill him. It's going to murder him, and it's enjoying. It wants to enjoy Solomon's suffering and and spending his last moments in fear. But instead of just um, succumbing to to defeat, uh, Solomon Kane is driven to rage because he's like, "How dare this thing, like, like do this? Like, we'll be put me in this position." And he's just so he's like so hate filled. And so, uh, and his desire to, to destroy this enemy is, fills him so much that he grabs it by like the neck and starts to drive it off. And because it's, it's a way that he writes it is something really interesting. It's like Solomon Cain himself is partially a, a, a spirit himself. He can, his pistol can't harm it, his sword can't harm it, but his bare hands can grab it. And the thing gets scared of him as he's like, like, like he has murder in his eyes mm -hmm. and it runs away from him. And I remember reading that, thinking that's such an awesome um, story. Yeah, and it is funny you to not to bring up Berserk again, but it is it is funny with that because the the Dragon Slayer guts his guts his quote unquote sword, even though it's it's always described as too too thick too thick looking and too rough to be it to be a sword. It's more like just a a hunk of metal. Um, norm. Originally, it was just it was just a big hunk of iron, but because he had killed so many apostles with it, it became this thing that exists between worlds. Yeah, and I'm I'm not a huge huge berserker reader, but I, I actually want to, I think that too the original creator of the sword, it was it was commissioned on like a contest for who could create a sword that could potentially kill a. A mythical dragon, even though at the time there was no such thing as dragons, mm -hmm. and so he had built this just oversized piece of metal that he never expected anyone act would actually use. There was also the fact he was sick. He he was sick of 
people saying that they w people wanting elegant swordsman sh sword um, design yeah. from him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's it is a, I, I I haven't read the whole manga, but um, yeah, I do remember that. Yes, yeah, it's the sword itself is not was not like it's it's got pretty mundane origins, but it sort of begins to possess supernatural origins as it's um, being used in the way that it has. Hmm. And you know that's that, that is interesting because I've seen other fantasy worlds um, touch on the creation of magic items being their origins, an item that is basically used to perform some great achievement. And it's like permanently either stained or um, like resonates with whatever that deed was. Yeah, some some of that is ju is just a is just a concept that is just I see a lot I, you see a lot of that in um in 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 Japan at the in Japan at the very least the because of the concept of even items having their own kami mm. and there and there's been there's been plenty there's been plenty of other cases th throughout throughout myth throughout mythology of of using that you of that magic item being more of a key within a within a given story um if i had to use a contemporary example of that concept of it be of it being more of a key than just a weapon i would say the soul reaver in the legacy of kane games oh uh, you know i wish i would have played those games why well, I, I there i so many people told me great things about the story for the legacy of kane games i've never actually played them though mm-hmm um, I do know that somebody con somebody tried to condense the whole the whole story from Blood Omen all the way through Defiance into one video. It mm -hmm. is a it is a lengthy video, but th but that is an option that can be taken. Um, <laughs> I'll check it out. The and the with what is and what and what's kind of what's kind of amusing in in that case is even though. I think I think Dayak had said one of his big influences was Wheel of Time. I also see a fair bit of Moorcock's influence, especially with the Soul Reaver itself. It's just not as not as outwardly host, hostile as say Stormbringer is to Elric. Sure. Yeah, I mean that's not surprising. There's so many so much uh, modern fantasy is influenced by Moorcock, even though um, most people don't realize it. I would say, I rem I remember a, I remember a certain person just say, just saying that The Witcher was just, was just a shameless rip off of Moorcock's work. Oh yeah, people have said that multiple times. Yeah, and there's multiple. Yeah. Having having talked with having talked with a lot of people in with within within the regions where The Witcher blew blew up before before we got a we got a hold of it in the states. Um, I've come to I've come to learn that that is a bit disingenuous, especially since course, I mean, one... yeah, it's not it's not a perfect one for one, but I mean it's it's not also not unfair to say that there are obvious um, parallels and influences there. There well. are, there are, but I do think the term ripoff is you is become a has become a bit of a flanderized term, and the big thing I took the big thing I take away is. For a lot is a lot of the mythology is within that's shown within The Witcher is very unabashedly Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and when a, when so much of fantasy wants to focus on Brit wants to focus on British Isles style fantasy, something like that is going to stand out. Sure. Uh, I I also just I don't get. I don't. It doesn't really bother me. Uh, with I mean, one, I you're right. I don't like the labeling something a ripoff, unless it's obviously just a ripoff. But I mean, for the most part, everything is being influenced and borrowing from the a, a, some other piece of media. Um, I, I I've gotten a, a few people running Facebook ads now for Kickstarter who uh, they go and they post, uh, oh, nice. Uh, Warhammer ripoff you have <laughs> for Streets of Peril, 
And I, I, I just, I don't engage because like, there's no point. But every, I remember once in a while I'd be like, I, well, I'm sorry, I didn't realize Games Workshop had a monopoly on Launch Connects and. Oh, Holy I'm Roman sure. Air. I'm sure they try to. <laughs> <laughs> like the sole, like, reason, <laughs> the sole reason they have orc spelled with a K is because they couldn't tr is because they can't trademark the usual spelling of orc. Sure, I like. There's I. I even in the even in the back of Streets of Pearl, I put in the my in the book and the designers nuts. I give a nod to all the influences, including Warhammer and um, you know, like we talked earlier about the, the dice colors. Like I, I put in there that um, like Burning Wheel is what inspired me to use that. So like I don't have a problem with pointing out, yeah, these are the things that influenced me, these are the things I like and this is why the 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 art or the content that I create has those similarities, but at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean like it's a rip off. It's it's a one for one. Um, yeah, I, you're right. I don't. I'm not. I really don't care for that kind of language either. Yeah, and one thing. One thing. I'm one thing. I'm curious if you if th if this is something that's going to be to go in because since. Just to, just to use as an example, since the duelist is going to be re is meant to represent um, schools of fencing, I'm guessing the dif I'm guessing the different schools are rep. It says it's represented by the subclasses, but um, within within PD six there were a set there were a set of talents that weren't um, class centric, and I'm get I'm guessing that's going to be significantly expanded in, in Streets of Peril. Yes, there's probably. If I had it, I'd have to look through it. But there's, I have, in the in PD six, there's a, like, one page, um, of special traits in Streets of Peril. I have four pages, um, of special traits. And one of the things with uh, Streets of Peril is, some special traits will be class and subclass specific. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also tried to not do too much of that. Um, like, uh, there's no, like, one of the things I want to avoid is, um, you don't need to have one special trait to unlock another. No, cha which, no chaining. Yes, exact. Yes, exactly. So there's not like the, the 3.5, um, first edition Pathfinder type mechanics where you're like, I got to take this thing, which is stupid and I don't want it, but I want this other thing down the road. So... I always use take... Whirlwind Attack as my poster child for that problem. <laughs> yeah, of course, yes, yeah. Because of the sh because of the ridiculous amount of um, prepping and thus false choice that you ha that you have to do. Because for wor for Whirlwind Attack, you need you need to have Dex at thirteen, Intelligence at thirteen, which is odd because this isn't going to really use intelligence. Combat expertise, dodge, mobility, spring attack, and a BAB of four. Mm hmm. Just yeah, I, the, it was ridiculous. There was other things, too. I remember, like, the. I haven't played 3.5 in forever, but the, the prestige classes, too, a lot of them forced you to take suboptimal options so you, that you could move into that prestige class. Yeah. This is what this is what I refer to as false choice, right? Because yeah, you ha you have the your ch as you said before, you're choosing stuff that you don't necessarily want. You're you're just pick you're just picking them in order to get what you actually want, and you're and in these kind of situations, you're planning for that thing you actually want several levels in advance. So it's like level right. you you just leveled up. Now you can pick a feat, but you already <laughs> but. That's not going to feel like it's, it's not going to feel like much of a reward when you already know several sessions in advance what you're going to end up picking. Yeah, and special traits in Streets of Peril are probably closer to talents in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay than feats in Dungeons and Dragons. So they're interesting. They add a lot of like flavor, and uh, they, they're fun. Uh, and somewhat powerful for characters, but they're not as like super powerful and like. Or there, I don't think there's any one of them where like, well, you have to have this one in order to have an effective character. They're more mm -hmm. 
there are fun and interesting options for your character. I'm I'm guessing that you that um when it comes to ones with prerequisites, it's what those particular ones would be t would be tied in would be tied into a get a given a given class or, or or a given archetype to the point that if that taking it without that wouldn't make much sense like take like um taking something that's clearly designed to boost spellcasting rolls if you if you're playing a character who doesn't know how to use magic yeah, exactly. A lot of them actually will bolster the base class traits in some way. So um, there's one uh, fencing master for duelist where uh, their signature special trait, which is special techniques, they get to use it one more time per encounter. Mm -hmm. So obviously they're the only class that has that, so why would you give it to anyone else? And then um, anything related to um, spell casting or let's say from the example of cultists with miracles, those are going to be limited. Now there are going to be some special traits which mechanically could be um, something that a another class would want, but they're just um, they are designed in such a way to make that one class feel um, more interesting and uh, sort of keep stay within the archetype. Now. And this is this is actually I'm mean, gonna go off on a tangent a little bit, but this is where there's a kind of a I wanted to walk a, a fine line of having the archetypes and making characters feel like there's some the character has some sort of identity, and then kind of sh like shoehorning people into an archetype with no flexibility. Um, and so like while classes are the the starting point for characters. Ultimately, the goal was after you start playing, you, you're, you're adventurers now, and so you're you you get to make all kinds of decisions and have tons of flexibility as to how to advance your character from there because you're going to make choices and grow as a character based off of the kinds of campaign that you're playing or whatever you know. Like if you're playing in a you know recently we were playing a a pirate themed campaign and so every almost every character had some sort of nautical related skill mm -hmm. now with with that in with that in mind um what are you shooting f actually before before i even get into page count i i've i've been i've been neglecting the magic system and i suppose i suppose i should dive into that now Magic in the PD6, you just had you had spells and you had and you had miracles. Um, are those are those going to be the are those going to be the same the um, two primary spell lists in Streets of Peril, or are there more spell lists than just those two? It'll just be uh, spells and miracles for Streets of Peril, the core book. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the way, and I, if you've looked at through PD6, so the, the key differences between the two are that miracles are not as dangerous. There's no like, negative repercussions for performing miracles. But you, at, at some point uh, in a day, you're going to stop being able to perform miracles. Um, because as soon as you fail a miracle, you can't perform any more miracles for the day, and you have to go spend the night basically in vigil, praying and meditating to be able to get the ability to perform miracles again. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas spells, there is no limit to how and when you can cast spells. It's, it's not a Vancean style system. Thank God. So, um, but the caveat is magic is dangerous. And you can, you can be physically harmed by it, and one of the things that's in Streets of Peril, which is not in PD6, is something called etheric manifestations, mm -hmm. where you can just cause weird magical phenomena as a result of spellcasting. Yeah, and I'm get I'm guessing etheric manifestations is a is is it a is it a is it a random table or how or how do you have how do you have it work out? Yeah, so there's two options for it. One. Um, if you buy, if you have the, the book, you can just use the core or uh, a table that's in the book. So you can roll on the table, 
Uh, or the other thing, which will be an option, is a, uh, a card deck mm -hmm. so that you can just draw cards for the etheric manifestations. Um, I didn't want to force anyone to have to buy like niche um, hobby aids and gaming aids, so you don't have to have the card deck, but the card deck just makes it really fast and simple to just draw a card quickly. And um, when it comes to the full, when it comes to the manifestations table, is it still is it still d6 based or do or do you have it or is it using a different die? D6 based, so you're. You roll one dice for your tens and one dice for your ones. So it'll be 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 21, 22, 20. So it's basically 30, it'll be 33 different uh, op, uh, potential outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a second I was I was curious if it was going to be like D100 or, or something. No, I, I you know, my, um, <laughs> it would have been easier. <laughs> In some ways, I thought it would be easier to just do something like a D100, uh, but um, uh, doing it the way we did it, 33 options. I could, you know, with the card deck, I can't remember, but I think it's like 54 cards in the deck, so um, you do get more options with cards than you do with the, the chart, um, but I don't think anyone's going to complain. I think the chart's got a good balance and mixture of uh, different manifestations. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Book's done. It's already done. It's at 176 will be the final page count. Mm -hmm. And as far as the release window, are you, are you, sh I know, I know on the Kickstarter page it says, it says, it says July. But are you shooting for that as far as the PDF launch? Just for the PDF. So the P, the the day the the day it ends, and I'll have to check because I'm the physical one should not say July. But it, if it does, I'll have to fix it. But the the, the digital be the digital's done. Um, my myself and my editor we're, we're going through it again right now while we have the chance. I've done multiple takes going through it to look for errors. Mm -hmm. But for the, but otherwise it's done. So. As soon as July comes, everyone who's backed it, they're um, they're going to have their opportunity to download it, um, and then I'm going to order the physical copies right away. Mm -hmm. And I will I will certainly look forward to it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness once again. Yeah for having me. It was fun. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Cheers. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>